Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton joins us to talk about a variety of city issues. And we'll preview tonight's presidential debate from an economic and job creation perspective. That's next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Tempe police arrested three protesters attempting to shut down the Mill Avenue Bridge this morning. The demonstration evolved about 50 people calling attention to the shooting deaths of two African-American men by Tempe and Phoenix police. Protest organizer Reverend Jared Maupin and two others were arrested and booked for impeding a public thoroughfare after police say they failed to keep the demonstration on the sidewalk. There were no injuries reported and the bridge, which was briefly closed to traffic, reopened after police cleared the arrests. Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton joins us each month to discuss a variety of issues facing the city, including concerns over the actions of some Phoenix police officers. Joining us now is Phoenix Mayor. Greg Stanton, good to see you. Good to see Thanks you. Thanks for getting here. You, you, you see that situation in Tempe, thoughts just off the top of your head. Well, police have an incredibly difficult uh, job. We respect them so much. One of the most difficult jobs they have to do is to balance the interest of a peaceful protest. Peacefully protesting is part of the grand tradition of America. It's part of one of our protected civil rights. But to do so in a way in which you don't impede others' rights to transport themselves you know, to their job or their school or whatever they are doing. So you want to give people a fair and full opportunity to exercise their First Amendment rights, their civil disobedience um, uh, rights to get whatever message they get across, but do so in a way that doesn't impede everyone else's rights as well. Striking that right balance is something that we in the city of Phoenix work very hard uh, to do. And I think Chief Yonner and our leadership team of the city have struck the right balance uh, over the course of the number of years. Okay, so the protest, though, was involving police brutality uh, in general, a couple of mm -hmm. incidents in particular. We have the situation in Charlotte. Your thoughts on what's going on out there, not just the reaction, but what's going on with police departments and uh, what seems to be, as critics will note, uh, an increasing militarization of police departments. Your thoughts? Yeah, fair question. Look, uh, City of Phoenix is one of the largest police departments in the United States of America, one of the largest cities in the United States of America, and we pay close attention to national trends. And obviously it's very disappointing that there has been such a breakdown in communication and trust between police departments and the community as a whole, particularly communities of color. And so it's heartbreaking to see what's happening in uh, Charlotte. The truth is that police departments around the country work very hard to get it right, but they don't always get it right. And when you, when you make mistakes, you should acknowledge those mistakes. You should try to be as transparent as possible to release all information to the public as quickly as possible. And you should also have an a ethic of constant communication so that way you're communicating with leaders from all communities inc including and especially your diverse communities in your city isn't doesn't just occur when there is a difficult incident but instead is part of a much larger almost daily uh, conversation that's how you build trust in phoenix we had the united states attorney general visit phoenix just very recently to acknowledge Phoenix as one of the best in the country when it comes to police community relations. Now, we're not immune from issues. And what's going on in Charlotte and other difficult situations, it could happen in Phoenix, Arizona. The best way to deal with it is to be in constant communication with your, uh, with your community. By the way, it's also the reason why we put in this year's budget body cameras for every single police officer on the street. Body cameras is one way, not, not the total way, but one way uh, to build up better trust in the community because of better transparency. It's, it's one way to do that, provided those body cameras are turned on. It seems like increasingly with these incidents, body cameras are being turned off. You, you mentioned how you respond to this kind of a thing. How do you keep this kind of a thing from happening? I mean, it, again, are, are, are the critics right? Does it seem as though police departments are increasingly militarized? Well, when you say increasingly militarized, look, there was public policies uh, in the not too distant past in which you would have a lot of former military equipment, for example, being shipped to uh, police departments. I think the Obama administration has worked closely with police departments, especially big city police departments around the country, to strike a better balance in that regard. It wasn't always the default to take uh, used military equipment and ship it to uh, local uh, police departments. But the best way to deal with it, number one, strong leadership at the top. We have been so blessed in the city of Phoenix to have a leader like Chief Yonner, who I think understands the importance of 
uh, constant communication with all people in the community, especially communities of color. We have a brand new chief coming on board, Chief Jerry Williams, who's gonna be a great leader of this department and gonna continue that uh, ethic. Look, in the city of Phoenix, uh, when we realized we had challenges as it resulted with police interaction with people with various forms of uh, mental health uh, issues, you know what we did? We looked in the mirror and said we can do better. And we formed a mental health um, uh, uh, force that is specially trained officers that can better manage situations so that way um, issues of mental illness don't become deadly situations, but we better work with the mental, uh, the healthcare community so that we can de-escalate uh, situations. So instead of trying to avoid a situation, we took it head on and said we can do better as a uh, department, making sure that as we're hiring more officers, which we're doing right now, that we have diversity in who we're hiring, more women, more Latinos, more African Americans. We have a department that looks like the community. That will help build community trust as well. So there are things that we can do, and in Phoenix, we're trying to do it. The, uh, the equation of more guns in society, more police involved shootings, some see that as being something that uh, there's a correlation there. Do you think there's a correlation there? Oh, geez, uh, you're asking me questions uh, that uh, would take years of sociological uh, study, et cetera. Look, I think that the um, police chiefs uh, throughout throughout uh, recent history certainly have not been supportive of laws that allow for anyone and anyone it seems like to get guns. They, they've been supportive of smart laws that, redu re that result in a reduction in uh, gun violence. For example, you know, getting rid of gun show loopholes and appropriate background checks so that, so that way we know that people who should not be getting their hands on weapons aren't getting their hands on weapons. They've been in supportive of common sense gun safety uh, legislation. And I think the police chiefs were uh, right. And in part, uh, some of the issues that they're dealing with are the result of not having smart gun laws that result in greater uh, gun safety, yes, I do believe is, a, is an issue in our community. All right. Um, the settlement with the uh, X Valley Metro CEO, Stephen Banta, paid $180,000 basically to not to sue and to go away. Uh, you negotiated that contract. What are your thoughts about this? Well, I, first off, it's been incredibly disappointing that someone that we put public trust in has, has, did not keep up that uh, public trust, and we've learned some important lessons. Uh, you know, uh, Valley Metro is sort of a partnership of various local governments to provide good transportation to the people of Phoenix. There was not proper checks and balances in that system, so the CEO could keep submitting receipts that were not accurate and keep getting reimbursed uh, for those receipts. He could keep traveling uh, back home over and over and over again without the proper oversight. I think that lesson has been learned and the, and the proper protections are being put, uh, being put in place. And we should have learned that previously. Uh, in the city of Phoenix, that could never uh, occur that someone would si keep, uh, keep submitting receipts. When I first found out about it, we acted uh, quickly to say that the amount that he sought reimbursement for was inappropriate. Later on, we found out that there may have actually been some fraudulent activities, and I gotta be careful speaking about that because as we speak, there is still an ongoing criminal investigation of the allegations against uh, uh, Mr. Abanta. I can't speak to the settlement. I wasn't on the board when the settlement was made. I trust that the lawyers for Valley Metro gave it good advice to the board, and they made the best decision they could under the circumstances. But, but you were there for the contract, yeah. and the contract basically was $305,000. And as you mentioned, 125000 not paid because of unauthorized spending, 180000 paid so that he wouldn't sue. Uh, some folks are thinking, go, go ahead and sue. I mean, I mean wh why would you not want, uh, why do you think Valley Metro would not have wanted to sue? I, you know, got to be very careful again because I wasn't in the room as lawyers gave advice to the members of the board of Valley. I'm not on the, on the board of uh, Valley Metro uh, Rail, so I got to be careful trying to second guess a settlement that they made and all the legal issues that they were uh, dealing with. But I'll tell you this. The contract was a mistake. The contract was too one-sided. Um, Mr. Banta was at one time when he first came to Phoenix, you know, a national prospect that they that the group wanted to come to Phoenix. I didn't sign the original contract. I signed the subsequent uh, contract because I happened to be chair of the Valley Metro board at the uh, uh, at the time. And you know, the world is filled with irreplaceable. I mean, the graveyards are filled with irreplaceable uh, uh, people. And I think at the time that the contract should have been signed, it shouldn't have been as 
one-sided. He shouldn't have had such leverage over the board uh, at the time. And so when a mistake is made, you have to be willing to admit it. And looking back, the, the contract that was signed was inappropriate, that it, he, no one should be given that much leverage over the board and the opportunity to receive uh, taxpayer uh, dollars. Now, uh, at the time we found out about the problem with his seeking reimbursement of certain receipts, um, my concern was that he was really whining and dining on the public dime. It was subsequent that we found out that some of the information may actually have been fraudulent, putting people who were not actually attending right. um, lunches and dinners as part of the receipt seeking reimbursement. That's why there was an ongoing criminal investigation. I can't comment on sure. that, but I'm very, very concerned about the type of activity that we saw from and Mr. Banta. And I think that, that's the point, that other folks are very concerned that this guy's getting $180,000 not to sue when it sounds like, it, you know, bring it on, pal. I mean, what, what would you sue over? If you, you bring this case to, to a, a civil courtroom, all, everything he does comes out into the open. I, would he have, I don't, as you say, you can't, you're not involved with the settlement, but you were involved back in the contract. Yeah, so. I was involved with the, with the second contract yes. that he signed when he, after he had come to, uh, uh, to Phoenix. And again, looking back, I would say it was too much of a one-sided uh, uh, contract. And we have to be careful. Valley Metro is not a governmental entity per se, but the member organizations like the city of Phoenix are uh, governmental entities. And I think we've learned that even for organizations like that, especially for organizations like that, we need additional checks and balances. The same level of scrutiny that would be looked at for the city manager of Phoenix if he or she is submitting receipts for reimbursement, the same exact standard should apply for a quasi-governmental organization like uh, Valley Metro Rail. So look, in any leadership position, you should learn lessons, not make the mistakes of the past, and I believe that the right steps are being taken so that uh, those mistakes aren't made again. Now, before you get out of here, I know that you will be visiting uh, Taipei in mm -hmm. Taiwan. That's a sister city to Phoenix, correct? Taipei is one of our sister cities for the city of Phoenix and a very strong sister city okay, relationship. Okay, what, what, what is, I mean, we hear about sister cities all the time. What, yeah. what, what's the deal? What, what is a sister city? What, why is it important? Who cares? Well, sister cities has evolved over time. So the city of Phoenix has 10 sister uh, cities, including in Taipei, mainland China, in Israel, in Hermosillo, Mexico, which is a great sister city relationship, Calgary, Canada, and a, uh, and a few others. In the past, they started out as, believe it or not, as post-World War II, the State Department was promoting cities around the country to, to promote people-to-people -people exchanges with uh, sister cities. In, during my time as mayor, I've insisted that our sister city relationships become much more economic uh, partnerships. Now, I do believe that Phoenix is an international city. We have to think and act more uh, globally. Um, increasing export economy is a critically important part of the future of our local uh, economy. Having better relationships with the Asian world um, writ large is very important. The future of our economy as it relates to increasing uh, exporting to the Asian world will be very, very important. Foreign direct investment from the Asian world will be important to our to our city. And do so you, the city of Phoenix should be very involved internationally. Do you get concrete results from a sister city relationship? I mean, is there something substantive that we can look at and say, ah, that's because we're a sister city? Well, let me give you a perfect example when it comes to the Asian world writ large. Phoenix has a existing international flight to London through British Air. Um, it is critically important that we get an additional international air opportunities. So visiting a, a place like the Asian world and have an opportunity to meet with airline uh, folks to promote Phoenix is very, very important. Now, will it immediately, la uh, immediately land a new uh, flight? No, not necessarily, but it's important that you keep the promoting, uh, the promoting uh, effort. Uh, the, in this case, uh, you know, my trip itself will not be paid for by the city of Phoenix. It's being paid for by, uh, by uh, the university in the country of Taiwan uh, to have me visit a conference that's going on there. I will be bringing representatives of our uh, sister cities, but I want to make sure I, I leave this program saying that sister cities is an important program for uh, the city of Phoenix. Our relationship with Hermosillo, Mexico, where Phoenix has just opened up a trade office there in, in uh, Hermosillo, our cross-border relationship there in terms of increasing our export economy is critically important. And we need to adopt the same philosophy relative to the other locations that we have sister cities in mainland China, in Israel, in, in, in Europe, Canada uh, as well. Phoenix has to be an international city for our long-term success, and we should use sister cities as a bridge to accomplish that. All right, we got to stop you there. Good to see you, Mayor. Thanks good for joining you. us. As always, good to be on.
Beside Highway 191 near Clifton is a memorial to 1880s Arizona law and order. Then, as now, the Clifton Cliff Jail is a two-room hole, blasted from solid rock and fitted with iron bars paid for by the owners of Clifton's first copper mine. Local tradition says the jail's first unwilling guest was the local stonemason hired to build it. When he finished the jail, the mason decided to celebrate at Clifton's Hovey Dance Hall, where he downed snakehead whiskey and shot up the place. The dance hall belonged to the deputy sheriff, who rewarded his rowdy patron with a compulsory stay in his own creation. In 1906, a flash flood filled the ground level Bastille with water and mud, forcing the rescue of the prisoners by rope and the jail's closure. Today, it's dry, and visitors are welcome to take an eerie step down and back into Arizona history. Tonight, a record 100 million people are expected to watch the first presidential debate between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. The 90-minute debate is set to start in just about 15 minutes at Hofstra University in New York. The debate will include six topics, including the economy. And here now to discuss what voters should be listening for in terms of job creation and economic growth is Kerwin Brown, CEO of the Black Chamber of Arizona. And from the Phoenix Business Journal, we welcome Mike Sunnix. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining sure. us. What do you expect to hear tonight? I mean, we're going to hear a lot of stuff tonight, yeah. but we're going to get around to the economy one way, shape, or form here. What do you expect to hear? Well, I should hope we get around to the economy. Um, and what I'm hoping is that we hear some sus substantive uh, dialogue on exactly how to um, grow the economy. You know, we at the Chamber deal with, with a lot of the small businesses and getting growth because we feel like that's kind of the engine that drives uh, the, the overall economy. And I'm hoping to hear from, from both candidates exactly what they plan on doing for small businesses uh, to, um, to, to help, help grow the, uh, the economy. Do the, t uh, when it comes to the economy, these t candidates differ on a lot of things. Do they differ all that much economically? <clears throat> well, on trade, I think, I think Trump has been very aggressive against free trade. Hillary Clinton's been a, a little late comer um, to this, kind of pushed by Bernie Sanders on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, her, you know, her and her husband back, back NAFTA, and, and Trump has been a, a big opponent of that tax policy. She does want to raise taxes, kind of on on the top uh, top earners. Trump has some reforms, child care credits, um, changing to standard deductions, changing head of household types type things. What, what you probably see expect to see is is broad, big broad strokes from him and her maybe getting to more details and we'll see how Lester Holt, the moderator, kind of presses each of them um, on those for her to maybe be a little more specific on in general what she wants and for obviously Trump to offer some specifics which he's been resistant, resistant to do on a lot of issues. Some of the things that the small businesses as you mentioned in Arizona, um, what are they looking for? Are they looking for tax policy? Are they looking for other uh, keeping jobs uh, in America, trade policies, tariffs, these sorts of things? I think a little bit of everything, but I, th I think that, that primarily they're looking for opportunity. You know, there's, um, you know, both candidates have, have talked about, um, uh, you know, improving bridges and the infrastructure, which obviously could help help uh, some, some of the small businesses. But I, I really hope to hear some, some details, you know, how we, because I, I really think that might be short term. Uh, solutions. I think mm -hmm. it certainly could help spur the economy. But even further than that, long term, you know, exactly what policies or, or what initiatives are they looking to promote that are really going to spur the economic growth? Because things have been slow for a long time. We, we, we know that uh, Trump wants to renegotiate NAFTA and what has <coughs> uh, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. No, no place for that. Sounds like Clinton wants to, you know, kill any deal uh, that kills U.S. jobs. Arizona small business. You hear about NAFTA. Uh, how, how's that stand in the small business community? Well, I, I think the, the small businesses that I talk to are looking for opportunities in other countries. So, um, you know, he wants to renegotiate NAFTA. Yes. And so who knows what that would look like. But I think small businesses are looking for, for whatever uh, can come up that's going to really 
uh, uh, help them get involved in, in trade in different, different countries. You know, 80% of the market is going to be outside the United States. Let's figure out how not just the large corporations, but also small businesses can get involved. I know that uh, Clinton is talking about targeted tariffs on, on rule-breaking companies that, that ship uh, jobs off overseas and all these sorts of things, um, targeted tariffs. Uh, the effect, again, in Arizona, I mean, what are we seeing here? And uh, we hear about NAFTA and TPP, but for those of us who don't own a business, it just sounds like trade deals and trucks coming through and you know planes taking off. Yeah, I think trade in general, it's kind of where you're from. Um, there's a lot of businesses here that do a lot of business across the border with Mexico, and so they see some of the benefits of free trade. But then you also have a lot of folks from here from the Midwest, from the Rust Belt, and that's where the race is going to be won or lost probably nationally. And those places like Ohio and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, Michigan, have seen a lot of jobs, a lot of plants go. And so there are folks out here that, from that part of the world that, that understand some of the, uh, the, the drawbacks to free trade and some of the mistakes that have been made. And Trump and Bernie Sanders really tapped into that. And you're seeing Hillary Clinton talk about that. So that's why you've seen her kind of move kind of away from the democratic uh, free trade realm mm -hmm. into more talking about tariffs and, and and some protectionism. As far as taxes are concerned, personal taxes, corporate taxes, what are you expecting to hear tonight? <laughs> that's, that's hard. Expecting? Yes. Um, I think that uh, it, it'll be broached. Um, I really don't know, to be honest with you, what uh, you know, they're, they're going to talk about as far as taxes. You've got um, you know, one, one talking about uh, increasing taxes and someone else is talking about cutting taxes, even though if you look at it, you know, they're still increasing taxes. So. Uh, it, it'll be interesting to see exactly what comes out of this. As far as tax. corporate taxes, what do you think? I think that, um, once again, you, you're going to get things across the board. You're going to uh, hear probably one uh, candidate talk about uh, adding taxes on a, on a corporate basis and someone else cutting taxes on a corporate basis. I just I think that the devil's going to be in the details. So I'm interested in finding out exactly um, so if you cut, if you're talking about cutting or adding taxes, how are you going to do it? What are the repercussions from actually doing that? Overall, you've got to look at a, a global effect of exactly what your plan is going to do to the economy overall. That's been the big challenge um, in the whole campaign is drilling down on, on a tax policy. It's, it's so dominated by Trump and personality and, and Mrs. Clinton's email issues and, and those types of issues. And, and that's what everybody's expecting to see tonight. And so the challenge is for, for the moderator and for us in the media is, is, is how to get those specifics out there because a lot of small business people don't know what each, each of them have yeah. proposed because of all the noise. If you don't hear particulars, if you don't hear specifics, what do you think? I think it's a missed opportunity. You know, if, if, they, don't, if they don't talk about uh, some of the specifics, especially on taxes, because that's, that's going to, to have an effect. You know, so whatever you're going to do, whatever your policy is, whatever your initiatives are that are going to affect taxes, it's going to affect everybody. So it's, it, we need to know, you know, exactly uh, what your policies are and, and what the repercussions are and how you're going to deal with those. As far as manufacturing is concerned, I mean, I think both Clinton and Trump are basically saying, you know, forget going overseas, keep the jobs here, increase the jobs here. Manufacturing is actually doing kind of well, is it not? I mean, it, comparatively speaking yeah. from the late 70s, yeah, yeah. no, but it's not doing that badly right now. There, there's been some companies bringing, bringing things back, but, but the public believes it's still going. You see these, these uh, news announcements like Carrier, like Ford, moving manufacturing jobs to Mexico, and that is right in Trump's wheelhouse. Those are the voters he's going after, white working class voters, uh, lower educated voters, and, and, and so that fits his narrative so very well. So some of the numbers are there, and there are manufacturing jobs coming back. There's are manufacturing jobs growing in some areas. Yeah. But, but I think it's been to, ben, to benefit him a lot, um, some of these announcements. And the perception is still that the jobs are leaving. I think people have to be careful. Um, you know, adding to, to manufacturing doesn't mean that all these jobs are coming back. There's a lot of those jobs that have been eliminated, and they're not coming back. Manufacturing is going to be coming more and more, um, you know, computerized. So I, I think that the perception, they, you, you need to be careful on exactly what your perception is as far as having more manufacturing um, in the United States. So the s specifics of the manufacturing exactly. is key. Right. Agree with that? Yeah, I, I think the, whole, the, the key to the debate is, is Trump needs to show some specifics. 
I'm, I'm ready to be president, I have the temperament, but also I, I, can, I have, have command of some of these issues. The challenge for Clinton is she can't get too much in the policy book and start to get wonkish and talking about too much about tax rates. She needs to show kind of broader strokes about what, how I'm going to change folks' lives, how, how I empathize with you, and how I can lead the country. You wouldn't mind seeing some mawkishness, though, would you? Uh, not at all. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I thought. Good to have you both here. Thank Thanks for much. joining us. We appreciate yeah. it. Tuesday on Arizona Horizon, we'll hear how nonprofits can better communicate their message, and we'll look at a program that's keeping track of hummingbirds as they migrate around the state. That's on the next Arizona Horizon. Now, the presidential debate is next, and then we will be back with a special post-debate edition of Arizona Horizon. That's it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You... Enjoy the debate. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.